Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our webinar today on implementing safety risk assessment approaches. My name is Andy Lofton, and I'm a contractor supporting FTA's Public Transportation Agency Safety Plan, or PTASP, Technical Assistance Center. Joining me for our webinar today are Paulina Orchard, the Division Chief of FTA's Office of Safety Policy and Promotion, as well as Tamika Saunders, FTA's PTASP Implementation Program Manager. Now, we are also very pleased to be joined today by Mr. Anthony Carter. Mr. Carter is the Director of Risk Management at the Greater Richmond Transit Company in Richmond, Virginia. Mr. Carter is going to join us later in our presentation to provide his agency's perspective on implementing their safety risk assessment approach. Now, throughout today's webinar, we invite you to engage with us. And if you have any questions on the content being presented or the broader topic, we encourage you to enter those questions into the Q&A pod. The Q&A pod should be located on your Microsoft Teams window, and you can access it by using the talk bubble icon. It should be near the top of your window. And so at any point during our presentation, feel free to ask questions using that Q&A pod. And throughout the presentation, we have some specialists that are reviewing all of those questions as they come in and queuing them up for time that we've set aside at the end of our webinar to walk through all of the questions that we've gathered during the webinar. Now, also, for those of you who are familiar with our PTASP webinars, you probably know what I'm about to say. Both the slides that we'll be reviewing today, this presentation, as well as a recording of today's webinar, will be published by FTA on FTA's PTASP Technical Assistance Center's resource library. And those materials are typically published to the website within about two days of the webinar. So hopefully they'll be up there by the end of the week. If not, they will be by, by the end of the long holiday weekend. And so with that, let's get started. And let's review our webinar objectives. Number one, we're gonna discuss regulatory requirements for establishing safety risk assessment processes at our agency. We're going to also provide considerations for how you can begin to implement your own agency's safety risk assessment approach. So, of course, we're going to start by discussing the requirements. We're going to look at the regulation and see what it specifically requires for safety risk assessment. And then we're going to talk about some of those considerations things to think about when we apply these in practice at our transit agency. And then we get to the really good part. We're gonna turn our presentation over to um, Anthony to provide his perspective from, from his transit agency in Richmond to share experience on safety risk assessment and implementing safety risk assessment at his transit agency. And then finally, we're gonna finish off today's webinar with our Q&A session. And so with that, next we'd like to review a key, our icon legend. Um, you're gonna see these images throughout the webinar, the triangle with the exclamation point in it, this blue icon. This lets you know the slide that you're looking at is presenting a PTAS regulation requirement, right? We're talking about requirements. So you'll see this come up throughout. It's just an indicator to let you know that, that we're specifically talking about those regulatory requirements. And the orange document icon will show up when we're presenting a resource that you can access through FTA's PTAS resource library. Okay. Now, with that, let's get started talking about the regulatory requirements for safety risk assessment. Now, it's important to start off by, by noting that the PTAS regulation establishes requirements for a safety management system. And that safety management system, as defined by the regulation, includes the four components of SMS, which we're probably all very familiar with by now. That includes safety risk management, safety assurance, 
safety management policy, and safety promotion. And in today's webinar, we are really focused on the component of safety risk management, or SRM. And specifically, one of the sub-elements of the SRM component, which is safety risk assessment. And as you can see on your screen now, the SRM process as defined by the rules really made up of these three SRM elements. Number one, safety hazard identification. Number two, safety risk assessment, the topic of our webinar today. And then of course, safety risk mitigation. Next, we'd like to take a moment to ensure that we're all using the same terminology. Before we get into a discussion of safety risk assessment, we really need to make sure that we're all speaking the same language. And the first term that we'd like to review is risk. Now in the PTAS regulation in part 673, risk is defined as the composite of predicted severity, how bad, and likelihood, how often, of the potential effect of a hazard. So it's really important when we think of risk as defined by part 673, that we're thinking about risk as a unit of measure. Right? It's a combination of the measurement of severity and the measurement of likelihood. Now this is important to focus on because historically it may be the case that we have used this term, risk, to mean something a little bit different. We may have used risk to actually describe a, a hazard or a safety concern at our agency. For example, maybe we said something like debris that's left on the shop floor is a tripping risk. So however, in SMS, it could be very helpful to avoid using risk in this manner and instead focusing on how risk is defined in the regulation as a unit of measure, composite of predicted severity and likelihood. It's also important to note here that risk is about the future, right? And the reason that the term risk involves predicted severity and predicted likelihood, as opposed to the actual severity and the actual likelihood, is that we're provi providing our best understanding or our best prediction, our best guess, hopefully based on great available data, about what could happen in the future, about how often it could happen and about how bad it could get. So thinking about the future, thinking about what could happen is an important part of what makes SRM and specifically a safety risk assessment proactive in addressing safety. And also it's important to note that when we're assessing risk, right under part 673, we're not really assessing or measuring the risk of the hazard, but instead in our safety risk assessment, we're assessing the risk of the outcome of that hazard, the effects of that hazard. And that brings us to our next term, which is hazard. Now, hazard means any real or potential condition that can cause injury, illness, or death, damage to or loss of the facilities, equipment, rolling stock, or infrastructure of a public transportation system, or damage to the environment. So what does this mean for us? Well, it means it can be real. So it can be an actual observable condition it exists within our system today or it could be a potential hazard, a potential condition. It's a condition that maybe it doesn't exist today, but it could if our agency goes through with a planned change, for example. So a real condition observable in the system today, maybe ward breaks on our buses. A potential condition perhaps could be sharp curves that are planned as part of a new transit center that's being developed. So both of those real and potential are, are hazards under part 673. The other absolutely fundamental piece of what, it, the ha what a hazard is, is that it is a 
condition. It's not the event. It's not something that happens. And this is a key difference between perhaps traditional hazard management and the, the approach that maybe some agencies have used in the past where we could use the word hazard to actually refer to an event that has occurred, an actual occurrence, like a tire blowout. But within the context of safety risk management, the distinction that a hazard is actually the underlying condition and not the resulting event, it really helps frame this and it helps ensure that we're always focused on understanding the underlying safety concerns, the underlying origin of problems that can result, they can result in events. If we were to just jump straight into analyzing events, these bad things that have happened, we may miss the opportunity to avoid something by addressing an underlying problem in addressing and avoiding the potential negative effects that may haven't even happened yet. And that brings us to our next term, which is consequence. So we just talked about hazards, and we really can't talk about hazards without talking about the next piece, consequence. So part 673 requires transit agencies to assess, as we've mentioned, the likelihood and the severity of the consequences of hazards. One thing to note here is that in part 673, the text does not provide an explicit definition, for example, in the definition section of the word consequence. So transit agencies may choose to derive a definition for this term consequence, by using other text in part 673, which can help, help us to define it. So for example, you could define a consequence as the effect of a hazard involving injury, illness, or death, damage to or loss of the facilities, equipment, rolling stock, or infrastructure of your system, or damage to the environment. Now, because the focus of safety risk assessment is on the potential consequences of a hazard as opposed to the actual hazard, the actual condition itself. It's really important to be able to distinguish, distinguish between the hazard, that condition, and these potential consequences, the, the outcome, when you're conducting SRM activities. It's also good to keep in mind that one hazard could have multiple consequences. So you may choose to make decisions on how to address a hazard based on one of the potential effects or based on multiple of the potential consequences for that condition, for that hazard. So as an example, poorly terminated electrical connections, we could classify this as a hazard. It's a condition that could cause, could result in an electrical fire on a bus resulting in injuries requiring hospitalization. Now that same hazard could also result in property damage. And if it were to present system-wide, it could result in loss of service for the agency. So again, one hazard or condition may have multiple potential consequences. And then that brings us to our next term that we want to reinforce definition for, and that's event. So part 673 defines event as any accident, incident, or occurrence. Now you have to do a little more homework when you're looking at the definition section because each of those terms, accident, incident, and occurrence are also defined in part 673. Now while at first glance, it might appear that what we just talked about, a consequence, and this term, event, are the same thing, but Please keep in mind, these are addressed differently under Part 673. And right, so first of all, key difference, an event is something that's already happened. It has had observable effects. You have observed, it has occurred. And these observable effects help you classify it into one of these three types of events, either an accident, incident, or occurrence. Now under FTA's safety program regulations, Events may involve specific reporting requirements, and they may lead to the identification of hazards. 
through even investigation. So SRMs focus on the potential effects or consequences instead of focusing just on events, things that have happened. It helps us to ensure that we're not just trying to prevent that last thing that happened from happening again. Also, events can be an important source of information about other potential consequences. But to be proactive, we really need to look beyond events to all potential consequences of a hazard. Now, I know that was a lot of information for us to get started with, and we did want to remind participants that FTA has produced and published resources on these topics to help provide more information and assistance for the industry. And the first is a hazards and consequences self-guided learning tool, which you can use to actually actively be able to distinguish between hazards and consequences. Also, we'd like to direct participants, if you have other questions, towards FTA's PTAS Bus Workshop Participant Guide. And this participant guide, which is used for FTA's recent PTAS Bus Workshop, includes details on this topic, and specifically the most recent version that was published, you can refer to pages 25 through 34. So now that that's out of the way, and we're all on the same page with our definitions, we'd like to take a closer look at safety risk assessment. And remember, safety risk assessment sits right here in the middle of our SRM component, nestled in between safety hazard identification and safety risk mitigation. So what is safety risk assessment? And we're talking about requirements on this slide. So this, this is what's required by the PTAS regulation. So safety risk assessment is the assessment of the likelihood and the severity of the consequences of hazards. Also, agencies should consider existing mitigations when conducting safety risk assessments. Also, now we'd like to move on to a few specific definitions within safety risk assessment to help make sure we can guide our further discussions on this topic. And there's three key terms that we want to review. Number one, likelihood. Likelihood is a predicted measure of how often something can happen, right? How often a consequence could occur. Severity, how bad could it be? Right. How bad could a consequence be if it occurs? And then safety risk, the combined measure of this predicted likelihood and predicted severity of the potential effect of a hazard. Now, FTA has developed sample safety risk assessment matrices. And these were developed really to help serve as a reference and, and provide more information on this, the overall safety risk assessment process. And we'd like to note that while transit agencies, if you look at the regulation, you're not required to create a safety risk assessment matrix specifically, we see that it is it almost universally applied at transit agencies. It's a very common way and useful way to address the requirements of Part 673. And so this document provides a nice overview for the safety risk assessment process and provides some, some model matrices that you could use, you could modify, and consider applying at your agency if, if you're looking for assistance there. Now, as you implement safety risk assessment and the overall SRM process at your agency, it's very useful to keep in mind how these SRM processes interact with your larger SMS framework. Think about that whole circular graphic we looked at there. So some, some examples. So your safety hazard identification process, it's got a lot of inputs. Think about our employee safety reports. Think about the, the data that we're capturing through accident investigations. Maybe we're identifying hazards. Maybe through our safety assurance activities 
related to safety performance monitoring, right? So we get all these inputs from other pieces of our safety management system. Also with safety risk assessment, when we're trying to identify the predicted likelihood and severity of a potential consequence, it might be useful to use data, perhaps from our accident investigations, from our safety performance monitoring activities to inform those assessments. And then of course, we get to the safety risk mitigation stage where we address this safety risk and we produce outputs. You know, perhaps we close the loop with our employee safety reporting program and the individuals that originally reported the concern. Now we have outputs, we have mitigations that we need to monitor, implement, and then monitor the effectiveness of. So everything we're doing in SMS is having inputs and or outputs that are driving other components of our safety management system. And now we wanna talk about some considerations and thinking about what a safety risk assessment can look like on the ground at your transit agency. Now at its most fundamental, the bare bones safety risk assessment takes the potential consequences that are identified during that safety hazard identification step and then assigns the potential consequence a likelihood rating and a severity rating. And remember, we're just talking about, you know, this means how often something's likely to occur and how, how bad it could be if it does occur. Now, the reality is that most transit agencies are going to identify a large number of hazards. And this means that in some cases, the agency may decide not to apply safety resources to formally assess every hazard and its potential consequences. And it might be that an agency selects which hazards make their way through the formal safety risk assessment process. So in such a situation, agencies may assign the authority, accountability, and responsibility for determining which of these hazards are going to move through the formal safety risk assessment process. And some examples we're providing, and again, these are just hypothetical considerations for if your agency maybe is figuring out a way of not moving every single identified hazard through a formal safety risk assessment, you know, considering, well, how do we make that determination? And, and here are some examples where an agency, a hypothetical agency, has addressed that. And in this example, they've authorized the CSO to be the individual who determines which safety hazards are going to go through that formal assessment. They've, they've held the accountable executive accountable for the decisions that that CSO makes in determining which, which hazards are going to go through the formal process. And then they allow the CSO to assign responsibility for determining which safety hazards to assess to specific subject matter experts throughout the agency. Leveraging engineering staff, for example, to determine whether or not engineering related hazards need to go through the formal safety risk assessment. Now, the PTAS Technical Assistance Center has reviewed a, a, over 300 agency safety plans. And one thing that the TAC has noticed is um, while the ASPs reviewed describe a process for identifying hazards, and those hazards potential consequences and a process for assessing the safety risk of those potential consequences. Some agencies have not described the linkage between those two things, right? How the agency moves from this identification stage, identifying the hazard and the consequences, and then moves it into the safety risk assessment phase of SRM. Now, some agencies choose to use a safety risk register to manage this and to document all of their SRM activities. And FTA has seen where this can be very helpful to ensure there's a link between that safety hazard identification step and the safety risk assessment. As I mentioned to you earlier, 
FTA's sample safety risk assessment register and the accompanying guide um, can provide more information on safety risk registers and examples that you can apply at your agency. Now, once we get past that step, once your agency has decided which hazards are going to be assessed through this safety risk assessment, you may wonder about the consequences. And as we talked about earlier, hazards often have more than one potential consequence. Now, your agency does not have to assess the safety risk of each potential consequence. You could consider putting together a process that determines which potential consequence your agency is going to assess through the formal safety risk assessment. And again, this is just a consideration if your agency doesn't already have such a, a, a mechanism in place. Now, over the next couple of slides, we're going to focus on this topic. We're going to discuss a few ways that your agency could approach this, determining which potential consequence for a hazard you're going to assess. Now, there are some common approaches, and we've listed four here. Number one, agency could decide, we're going to assess every potential consequence associated with this hazard. They could say, we're going to assess what we, what we think is the most likely potential consequence, or we're going to assess what we think is the worst potential consequence, or we're going to assess what we believe at this point to be the worst credible potential consequence. Now, your agency could decide on its own approach for how it's going to do this. We did want to provide some examples of approaches that are used in the industry and other industries. And we'd like to explore this a little bit further by using an example. And please keep in mind, this is a hypothetical example we've put together to illustrate how, A, hazards can have multiple potential consequences. And B, agencies can focus on all or one or multiple potential consequences for a formal safety risk assessment. All right, so in our example, we have a hazard, and it's a bus, bus misalignment over a maintenance pit. And in this example, the agencies identified three potential consequences. One, bus falls into the pit and there's and results in structural damage. Number two is that there's a worker injury. Um, resulting into this um, bus fall into the pit. And number three is that there's actually a worker fatality. Now, with those three potential consequences, your agency could choose to assess the safety risk of all of them. Right? Looking at all three, assessing the safety risk of, of um, sustaining structural damage from a bus falling into a pit, of a worker injury related to a bus falling into a pit or a worker fatality from a bus falling into a pit. Your agency, on the other hand, may decide to choose um, to assess the safety risk of the most likely potential consequence. So in this example, the agency has determined that the structural damage potential consequence is the most likely based on their current understanding. And they may use any historical data related to this hazard to be able to make a determination. Again, this is happening before the formal safety risk assessment. But it may help you be able to determine which potential consequence is the most likely if you wanted to proceed in this manner. And so in this case, the agency decided that um, the most likely would be the structural damage, and so they've decided to assess the safety risk associated with this potential consequence. Alternatively, the agency could focus on the worst possible, focusing on the um, worker fatality and assessing the risk associated with that. And of course, the last example of the worst credible potential consequence, and perhaps the agency in this situation does not believe that the fatality is a credible potential consequence based on the specifics of the agency and subject matter expertise and information available to them at that point. And so they decide to focus on, on this potential consequence. Now, when we use that term credible, we're talking about consequences that 
could reasonably be expected to happen. All right. Now, with anything where you have a set of choices or a menu to choose from, you're going to have pros and cons. And we just wanted to take a minute to lay this out and present pros and cons for each of these four options of selecting potential consequences, which your agency would take through that formal safety risk assessment. So the first, again, this is the agency saying, we're going to perform this assessment for all of our identified potential consequences. What's the obvious pro? Well, we're pretty sure that we've accounted for all possible outcomes. What's the con? It takes more time, it takes more resources, it's a bigger lift to do all of this analysis. All right, so that's your trade-off. What about the next one, most likely potential consequence? Well, a pro is this could help us conserve um, our time. And this could also be beneficial if we feel like we would waste time focusing on consequences that are really unlikely to occur. But a con is that it may not address some more severe consequences that even though they may be less likely, they, they could ultimately be a greater concern to the agency. And then, of course, our, our worst potential consequence. And again, this could help reduce the severity of that, that the bad one, that big concern that we have, the potential for the devastating consequence. But the con is that it may not address some of the less severe consequences which maybe over time could be very consequential for the agency. And then of course the worst credible, which again may help your agency address that most severe consequence that it believes could occur, but it may not allow your agency to address these less severe, but really potentially more likely to occur consequences. Now, it's important to remember that your agency also would not have to use the same approach for every single hazard. Your agency could choose to assess the safety risk of the most likely potential consequence when it's, you know, look, talking about one hazard, but for another, it could focus on the worst potential consequence. And some agencies may choose to authorize the CSO or another individual within the organization to decide which approach is most appropriate for each hazard. Also, we've seen that it, uh, agencies could use a committee and made up of, of subject matter experts to, to help assist in, make, in the agency making these decisions. Um, in the, our, the PTAS tax review of agency safety plans, we've seen that some agencies delegate this decision about moving these hazards through the formal safety risk assessment to a committee that really supports the whole SRM process for the agency. So regardless of which approach or regardless of which combination of approaches your agency ultimately settles on, please don't forget about documentation, documenting your decisions, documenting the decision-making process itself, as well as the related authorities, accountabilities, and responsibilities. Now, once an agency has decided which potential consequences to assess, we can actually start on our safety risk assessment. And of course, our safety risk assessment, sorry to sound repetitive, but this is the fundamental piece of today's webinar. Remember that our safety risk assessment is about determining the likelihood and the severity of the potential consequence. And also, um, your, a your ASP already should outline your agency's process for doing this. Now, one way that your agency may document your safety risk assessment is through the use of a safety risk register. So the example on your screen presents a sample record. And what you can see popping out here is the likelihood and severity ratings that were assigned through a safety risk assessment, as well as an overall composite risk, right? And of course, the composite, it's a composite of severity and likelihood. Now, in this example, we're using specific codes, right? There's a number, and then there's a letter, and then the composite 
combines them for a 1C. Agencies can use whatever categorization they feel is, is necessary. Um, and this is not a specific requirement to do it this way. Um, it's just provided as an example. And we've seen a lot of similar approaches through the PTAS tax review of, of agency safety plans and associated materials. In FDA's sample safety risk assessment matrices for bus agencies, can give you a lot more um, great information on, on how to establish criteria for determining likelihood and severity for making those um, assessment ratings. And also it's just a great resource for giving you example matrices. Now with that, we'd like to move on to considerations for actually implementing the safety risk assessment process at your agency. And we're talking about in practice, on the ground, carrying out that new ASP that we've developed. Now, one, of, one way to approach this implementation phase that we're in now, is gonna be to identify and then address implementation gaps. And we've provided here uh, uh, an example framework that you could use when you're approaching this implementation task. And it's, it's a three-step process. Number one, we've got to evaluate our implementation status. Right? Are we following our ASP? What are we actually doing on the ground? We've got this new ASP in place. What, what, are, we, what are we seeing, observing, or organization actually doing? Um, when we find any gaps, we're going to characterize them. In other words, we're going to better understand them. We're going to put them in an appropriate category because that's going to help us best in step three, address them. In other words, to close that implementation gap. So let's take a moment and look at each of those steps in a little bit more detail. So number one, we want to evaluate implementation status. So really what we do, we take our ASP in one hand, and we take our binoculars in the other hand, we see what we've written in our ASP, this is how our agency is going to do it. Um, we're confident in this process, it complies with part 673. And then, and then we use our other hand, we look out across the agency and we see what's actually happening in practice. Now, if we find that the agency's actual practices don't meet our documented process, well, that's what we're, we're referring to as an implementation gap. And it's going to be great. We could look out across our agency and see no gaps. But unfortunately, I think is the reality with the implementation of any new approach to safety, any new safety plan, is that the reality is that we're going to see some implementation gaps. So number one, we have to identify those gaps. And then that brings us to our next step, which is to characterize them. And Again, we're trying to better understand the gap so that we can best address it in step three. And three categories that FTA has presented, which it feels may be useful to transit agencies that are going through this process, is bucketing these gaps into these categories. So number one is, is doing something new. Maybe our ASP has specified a completely new process. And now we've identified this implementation gap and really the origin is that now we're asked to do something new. We've never done this before. The second type could be do something differently. And this may be that our ASP has changed the way that we've already been doing an activity. We've seen quite a lot of this at the agency. A lot of our transit agencies have had robust safety programs and activities, and it could be that the ASP now makes changes to certain activities that we've been doing. And what we've also seen is that in these situations, doing something differently can actually be even harder than doing something new because we're talking about agency resources and personnel that have maybe been doing something for a long time. And sometimes it's harder to change, to shift the momentum of a moving object than to put something in motion to start. And then our third category is doing something consistently. And this is perhaps where we have a practice in place in our agency, but we just don't apply it agency-wide. Or we just don't use it all the time. Or it's been sitting on the shelf for a while. We used to do it, but, but we haven't done it in a while. We call this doing something consistently. And that brings us to step three is we got to close those gaps. 
And the way FDA has recommended to do that is just to develop a project that's going to address the gaps and identify what's the outcome we want to achieve to close this gap. What are the tasks? What are the things we're going to do? And assigning the roles and responsibilities, the milestones, timelines, due dates for those tasks and deliverables to make sure that we achieve our objective, close the gap, and are actually carrying out our activities in alignment with our ASP. Now, next, what we'd like to do is to present some of the implementation gaps that perhaps are most common right out of the gate with um, transit agencies and implementing an agency safety plan. And the first of those is, is definitional. And specifically, it's the term hazard. Now, many agencies may have already had a, a working term or a working definition, I should say, of the term hazard. But now, with the agency safety plan and the definition likely defined in the agency safety plan related to hazard and also potential consequences, this may have fundamentally changed how the agency uses that word. And as a result, um, what the agency is doing maybe doesn't align with its ASP. And this is an implementation gap. So the agency may need to change what it's doing in order to apply these definitions um, that are laid out in the ASP. And so what we wanted to do is just kind of simplify this process and throw out a couple slides here on gaps and, and, and framing them so that we identify them, we characterize them and put together a project. So for this example, we have the definitional gap about hazard and potential consequences. We characterize it, we decided, you know, we've done this before, we're just changing how we refer to these things. And so our project in order to close the gap is we're gonna need to modify the materials that maybe we've had in place for a long time, which reference maybe hazard, which now need to be updated to, to ensure alignment with the agency safety plan. We might also need to look at our training related to these activities to ensure that the terminology and definitions presented in that training align with our current approach to safety and specifically our agency safety plan. Another common gap is, we talked a little bit about this, is determining which of these hazards to take through formal safety risk assessment. And remember, it might be impossible for your agency to, to formally do a safety risk assessment for all hazards and potential consequences. It may not be possible, it may simply not be appropriate at your agency. Um, so let's talk about this gap in a little more detail. So number one, we don't have a process for determining which of our hazards we're gonna take through formal safety risk assessment. And so what kind of gap is this? Well, this is actually something new. We've never had this before. So what does the agency do? Well, it defines a project. And it's gonna develop a process for determining which of these hazards it assesses. And it does it by, we're gonna develop criteria that let us know which safety hazards are going to go through the formal assessment. We're gonna define the authorities, accountabilities, and responsibilities that are associated with that prioritization. We may decide to run a pilot right, to test this and make sure it's actually going to work to demonstrate, prove to ourselves that it works and also demonstrate to leadership to help um, firm up confidence in the safety risk management approach in this change. And then there are, we're also going to look at training for all those individuals who are supporting the SRM process. We're going to make updates to our agency materials and documents that may exist outside of our our new ASP. So what about another gap? And another common gap that we flagged is consistent documentation. So some agencies may have conducted safety risk assessment activities or other hazard related activities before part 673 came along, but they may not have consistently documented those activities. And so agencies may need to work to ensure that now under PTAS and according to their agency safety plan is that they're consistently documenting their safety risk assessment activities. All right, so what is this gap? Well, we have that we're not consistently documenting the outcomes of our safety risk assessments. What, what kind of, of gap is this? Well, you know, we, we used to do this sometimes, we just don't always do it. So this is doing something consistently. 
And our project that we're going to develop for this is the agency thinks about it and decides they're going to provide training for those individuals that are now supporting the safety risk management process. And they're going to look at all the agency materials that currently exist, all of the documentation that supports the SRM activities, and they're, they're going to update them to make sure that they work with the new SRM processes. And if this, this agency decides to task its chief safety officer to perform regular compliance audits to make sure now, you know, we've got this new process, we've got folks trained, and, and the compliance audits are going to ensure that the process is being followed by the agency. So again, just wanted to share some of those common gaps, and maybe your agencies are seeing similar realities on the ground as you begin to implement your agency safety plan. So with that, we actually are moving to the best part of today's webinar, and that is where we get our industry participation. And we are lucky to have with us today, Mr. Anthony T. Carter, Jr. And Mr. Carter joined GRTC in 2015 in Richmond, Virginia, as the director of the Risk Management Safety and Training Office. And in this role, he's responsible for overseeing claims handling process. His claims include bodily injury, workers' compensation, property damage claims, and others that are presented against GRTC. You know, he's also responsible for creating and implementing safety policies and procedures for the agency and making sure that the agency stays within compliance for all safety rules and regulations. He serves as the agency's safety plan's chief safety officer and he's responsible for the training of all new hires at the agency, as well as seasoned employees to make sure everyone has the proper educational resource to keep them safe and successful. Prior to joining GRTC in 2015, Mr. Carter was a senior insurance fraud investigator with Century Insurance. He was responsible for reviewing and investigating large commercial transportation losses, and also responsible for reviewing and updating the investigative procedures of the claims process and leading training sessions for what to look for when identifying fraudulent activity in large losses. Additionally, he was focused on identifying safety issues and violations that could create large claims for certain clients that the company insured. Mr. Carter holds an MBA from Walden University and an undergraduate degree from Virginia State University. Mr. Carter, welcome. And Anthony, I'm not sure, I can't hear you yet. You might still be on mute. Okay, I think I'm coming out now. Loud and clear, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the wonderful introduction. Um, good afternoon, everyone. It's always an honor and a pleasure to speak with um, peers in the transportation agency. I always look at this as an opportunity to not only gain information, but just meet others. And um, hopefully once we get past the COVID and restrictions um, open back up, we can do this more often and in person. But certainly want to thank everybody for um, tuning in. GRTC safety risk management and uh, risk assessment when it comes to our agency safety plan. Um, first and foremost, you know, we are privileged here because we have a CEO and a chief operating officer that are willing to give us many, many different resources. And that's really what it takes, not only for the risk assessment side, but the entire agency safety plan. Um, some of the characteristics of this company um, I'm not going to certainly not going to read all of this, but um, it, it, you may see we've been around since 1860. Um, this is a public transit system known as GRTC Transit System today. We operated during the Civil War for over 150 years, um, and only were shut down one time, and that was actually during the Civil War, which is crazy when you think about it. We are one of the oldest transit agencies in the country. Um, and like I said, I'm not going to read all this, but a lot of the, the, the characteristics of us, we give certain services, our bus rapid transit service, which is a new mode of transportation that we just recently opened, um, ride finders and specialized transit transportation. We um, transport in Richmond, Virginia, 
Chesterfield and Henrico counties, um, which are the surrounding counties around the Richmond area, but primarily we're in the city of Richmond. Um, so far as our actual safety risk assessment, and please understand um, these are not anything that FTA or any guidelines that I give today, this, this is what works for our agency. Um, this is things that we have come up with that we found just works for the entire company as a whole when it comes to our agency safety plan. Starting off, as we're able to discuss, when putting the risk assessment process in place, it was determined that many characteristics required to make this plan successful were already implemented. And we touched on that early in the presentation. A lot of things that you're, you're going to find that work for your company according to your agency safety plan, you already have in place. It's just a matter of tweaking them. It's just a matter of tightening up on the documentation. It's just a matter of seeing them all the way out. Um, we were able to find a lot of programs and safety-related programs and trainings that we had been re that we had been already using, and we just needed to tweak them or, or turn a little bit around to make them compliance or compliant with our safety agency plan. Um, areas that we identified that needed improvement were documentation. And, you know, you're going to find that, I'm sure, across a lot of the transit agencies that your documentation, yeah, is there, but being able to document things to the actual end of the project. We touched earlier about the projects. When you're assessing risk and when you're, assessing, and you're getting these actual hazards that are being reported in, yeah, you're documenting them. And then it sort of the follow-up sort of falls falls along the wayside, and there's no documentation. You come up with a plan on how you're going to correct that, but there's no documentation on what you actually did or who actually saw that out. And that's where the risk register comes in, and the risk register has really helped us. And basically, what we do is we document from beginning to end. Once the actual risk has been reported, and that's reported through a number of different ways that we were able to set up uh, through the technology side of our company with the email. We have a safety email. We have a safety hotline. We have uh, you know, a, a hotline that you can actually call anonymously um, and just leave information that people have seen. We have dispatch. We have operators that are calling in every time they see something. And then the dispatch or supervisor will report it to our safety coordinator, which is a big part of our agency safety plan. And then we'll actually turn that over to the safety matter experts. Now, when we have the safety matter expert committee meetings, we're assessing everything. And some of those things, some of the hazards that we're identifying or some of the risks that we're identifying, we don't actually take through the entire process. Some of those things we can, depending on what the consequence we feel or what the consequence is going to be, we can handle it right there and there, and we don't even have to have a meeting on it to take it through the entire process. And then there are other uh, risks or hazards that we identify that are going to need additional resources. And depending on the amount of resources that you need, may have to go up higher on the executive level. Um, as I stated earlier, we're lucky enough to have a CEO and a chief operating officer who's willing to put a lot of resources into this uh, safety management plan. And they want to see our employees as well as our customers as safe as possible. So I have an open line to my CEO anytime something comes up of that nature where I have to elevate it to that level. Um, that gets number one priority, and we put a lot of resources in right away to uh, correct that issue. So far as the safety matter experts, um, they are originating from all across the company. Um, we have transportation, we have maintenance, we have compliance, we have facilities, we have road supervisors, we have planning, we have human resources. We have a committee that is put together of different um, individuals that are experts in their department and they come together and we meet and we discuss it. Right now our schedule is every other week we have a meeting. If we have an actual situation that comes up, that may require us to have an immediate meeting or emergency meeting because we have to have this uh, assess or have to have this risk assessed right away, 
that's not a problem either. We call a quick meeting. Usually in those situations, um, my my boss, our chief operating officer, will be involved in that as well, and we discuss that, and we put in whatever resources we need to get that corrected, and that's a matter of documenting it on the actual risk register as well as assessing it. Um, as we touched on earlier, we have an assessment of the likelihood and the severity of it, and it's color coded, and it's uh, one, two, three, A, B, C, and that's the actual code that we put in place. Of course, one um, A is the most uh, severe risk, and that's colored in red. But it's different ways of uh, of assessing that, and that depends on what you're comfortable with as the head of your agency safety plan, and what your company feels is successful. You certainly don't have to use those type of codings, um, but that's just what works for us. And then we document it, carry it on. It's assigned to the actual uh, safety matter experts that are most uh, equipped to handle those type of situations. You know, we've had situations where maintenance has come up and we've identified risks with the maintenance department and uh, the, the safety of the buses. Well, of course, our safety matter expert that's going to lead that is our representative from the maintenance department, along with safety, along with transportation, and whoever else uh, would fit into that categorization of having expertise in that matter. And then we document, we assign it, we give dates, um, and all this is being documented until the completion of that actual risk being um, eliminated or some type of mitigation has come up to correct that, to move that from the most severe to the less severe status on the risk register. And we have documentation to show how we started this, even down to how it was reported, uh, what may take place, what may not take place, who's assigned to it, how it's being handled, and when it will be completed, as, as we touched on earlier. So a lot of those situations, you can see that it can get intense, and it can be a lot of documentation, but being able to assign individuals to that and having a committee that works on those type of things and that are willing to work on those type of things really helps the process go a lot smoother and a lot quicker than it seemed like it may. We're certainly not trying to rush anything, but at the same time, we want to be able to identify those situations and handle them as quickly as possible and as efficiently as possible and be able to document them as efficiently as possible. And that's where the safety uh, management plan really comes into play, especially the risk register, because it's all there for you. It's all documented out for you. You even can set up a timeline on when it's going to you know, take place, what's going to take place, who's handling it, and where they are, because they're constantly documenting it as well. Um, to move on to actual, you know, I, I want to touch on the aspect of the following up, and I think uh, Andy may have touched on it earlier. Documentation, that's, 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 that's priceless in this. I mean, being able to document and show what's actually working for you, being able to have a situation where something has come up and it's reported in. Um, and documenting where you are with it, what you've done on it, and just showing the steps that you've gone along the way to bring this to a conclusion will really go a long ways um, from the agency safety plan, but not only from the agency safety plan as a whole, but from the, the, the attitude and the behavior and the culture of all your employees. Because oftentimes, our employees, our operators, our road supervisors, those are the ones that are actually reporting these things into us. There are ears and eyes on the road. Um, also, we're getting a lot of reports from customers, passengers, our safety hotline. It's open to everyone. Everybody has access to these. So we've gotten complaints and we've gotten issues that have been identified by passengers riding the bus. And we've worked through them, worked through these situations, assigning them through our SMEs, and having committee meetings on them to regulate and to mitigate these, these issues that have come up. But the most important thing to understand with this is being able to have an open line of communication and being able to have an open line where employees, everyone feels safe 
reporting something and having different resources available so that they can report. As I touched earlier, we have our hotline that we set up. We have our email address that we set up. We have an open door policy. If you have safety concerns, talk to somebody on the safety staff. Um, and that includes our risk management department, our safety department, our training department. They have the they have an open door policy where if something's recognized, please stop by and say something. We have the suggestion box throughout the building, and we've been able to promote this through um, you know the technology that we have, which means that we're promoting this and we're encouraging people to if you see something, say something, so that once we get it, we're able to line it up, put it into our risk register, put it into our documentation process, keep track of it and move it along so that we can, you know, we can make we can make it happen and we can show that we're concerned about these things. And all of this is part of the assessment process. Um, as the, as the slide says, it starts with culture and it starts with an attitude. Participation from your employees, assign duties to your employees, which is part of the SMS. Um, a quick story, when I, when I sent out the e email for the SMS, I actually had people that were upset that they weren't asked to be on that committee because they wanted to be assigned and they wanted that duty of being, you know, more responsible for the safety side of things. So that was a little bit of a shock to me when I when I first started this. Um, you know, I thought that it was going to be like pulling teeth to get people to volunteer, but you know, everybody I asked, no questions. They were hands down in. And then, like I said, I got a few emails from a couple of the operators and a couple other employees that, you know, they wanted to join, but we just didn't have the room for them. But we made, you know, other opportunities for them to monitor safety and be be involved in this overall safety management of the company, which is, like I said, it's, it's that buy-in that you have to the culture to start um, the attitude to start to think about how you can be as safe as possible. Um, you know, just having the employees that are willing to report your hazards and the SMEs were willing to go out and inspect and create ideas and actions to eliminate those risks. And that's the basic, pro that's the process that we use, and that's the overall process of SME and having the, the committee that does it. I would strongly suggest anyone that, you know, doesn't have an SME committee to, to strongly look into that. And, and maybe it doesn't have to be a committee, it could be one or two people or, you know, a group of people such as what we have. But that's a, a real easy way of getting everybody's involvement in it and getting everybody's input in it and being able to assess the situation from different different minds looking at it and different expertise looking at it. Um, being able to have everybody's involvement is going to make a better outcome when you're trying to assess your, your risks that have been reported in and you're trying to um, document because you ultimately you have to have more than one, pe one, more than one person involved on this. Um, it certainly can't be something that the, S the CSO is assigned to. Um, just speaking for myself, I am the Chief Safety Officer for the Agency Safety Plan, but as I stated before, I have a team that does wonders um, with this, and they, they hit the ground running and were more than happy to do anything that was needed to keep the overall um, safety of, of, of the employees at GRTC number one priority. Um, I also encourage if you have the resources to reach out to a consultant for the safety management plan. You may not use the services or their services, but at least talk to them and get some ideas. We were able to um, use Reem Lazaro. He was excellent in trying to get us up and running. And he was the one that really came and looked at our overall aspect of the company from each department. and. He was the one that mentioned to us or looked at us and was like, some of these things you already have in place, it's just a matter of tweaking them. It's just a matter of changing them around. It's just a matter of renaming them. And that has worked wonders for us. A lot of stuff has fallen in place for us. So I, I would certainly, I would certainly um, encourage you, if you have the resources, and some, some don't, but if you have the resources to look into that and just get an idea from outside looking in to give you some perspective on how to, how to run your safety, uh, your agency safety plan. 
Um, but as I stated, I can't, I can't, I can't mention this enough. Documentation, being able to document what you're doing from beginning to end in the risk register is going to be the key, key factor when it comes to implementing safety risk, safety risk assessment. Um, no matter what you do, if it's not documented, it didn't happen. So make sure that you, once you receive those risks, once you have, have recognized the risks, being able to go through an actual register and documentation from beginning to end will make the process so much easier and you will get so many so much better results on the mitigations or the eliminations or whatever you do to to control that that risk that has been recognized and at the end of the day, as I stated before, it's certainly about the, the attitude, the behavior, and the culture of everybody involved in it. No matter how dedicated you as a chief, uh, chief safety officer or safety manager or the director of risk management, no matter how dedicated you are to keep everybody safe, if everybody else is not buying into this and if everybody else on board is not as dedicated to, to this as you are, then that's going to be a problem and you have to change the culture and you have to have buy-in so that everybody can be as safe as possible. And with that, um, uh, I didn't want to give a whole lot. I certainly didn't want to go on and on about this because we can talk about this for days, but um, I hope I gave you a few few good pointers on how to assess your, your risk and how to document everything. And I'll turn it back over to, I guess, Andy. Thank you. Anthony, thank you so much. We really, really appreciate you giving your time to share your experience with us and the entire group. That was awesome. Thank you. And, and as a note to participants, um, if you have questions for Anthony, you can also enter those directly into the Q&A pod, and we will work those into our Q&A session coming up shortly. But before we get to the Q&A session, I did want to take a moment to remind everyone about um, the PTAS Technical Assistance Center's resources that FKA has made available to the transit industry. Um, so the PTAS TAC is up and running. We, there is a um, phone line. You can reach a TAC specialist um, during normal business hours. And there's also an email address where you can email the, the PTAS TAC directly with any question related to the PTAS regulation and uh, requirements or implementation, anything like that, you can ask the PTAS TAC directly. Um, there's also links provided on the screen for the resource library of the PTAS Technical Assistance Center. And there's also links to the PTAS Community of Practice, an online forum to, uh, where agencies can share information as well as a frequently asked questions document that is updated periodically with um, obviously more frequently asked questions as the TAC processes in inquiries from the industry. 